Triple Tri Commission event demonstrates that uh, I think NDU is much more than just an attractive physical venue. Uh, through our talented leaders and faculty, we can also offer important intellectual contributions to the nation's most important security challenges, while also educating the next generation of national security leaders to make their own intellectual contributions. Today's discussion on the national security workforce reflects one of those important challenges and an essential part of great power competition. And of course, I'm also pleased and proud that two of those NDU leaders, uh, Dr. Laura Juner and Dr. Cassandra Lewis, have been invited to participate today. So thank you again for this opportunity for NDU to contribute virtually and intellectually. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to the Dean and Acting Chancellor of NDU's College of Information and Cyberspace, Dr. Cassandra Lewis. Thank you all once again for joining us today at the National Defense University. Thank you, Vice Admiral Rogi. As the host of today's event, the College of Information and Cyberspace recognizes that strengthening the national security workforce is a national imperative. In fact, we believe this critical mission is embedded in the DNA of our organization. One from our humble beginnings as the Department of Defense Computer Institute to our current distinction as the nation's only war college focused on educating DOD civilians, interagency partners, and allied nations on the inf information instrument of national power in the cyberspace domain. Our commitment to educating the national security workforce runs deep, as does our track record for serving as the hub for critical conversations and thought leaderships in these domains, which brings us to today's event. Today, we welcome the representatives from three national commissions. Each commission is a congressionally created bipartisan group with a mandate to address part of our national security landscape. Their specific mandates vary. The National Commission on Military, National and Public Service is tasked with developing recommendations to inspire more Americans, especially young people, to participate in military, national, and public service, and to review the military selective process. The National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence has a mandate to consider the methods and means necessary to advance the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to comprehensively address the national security and defense needs of the United States. Finally, the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission has been instructed to develop a consensus on a strategic approach to defending the United States in cyberspace against cyber attacks of significant consequences. Across all three commissions, a common theme has emerged. In order to fulfill these critical national security functions, we need to reinforce our national policies and systems that support a strong national security workforce. To catalyze action on these critical issues, last month, the Commission sent a joint letter to the leadership of the Senate and House Armed Services Committee requesting action in the FY21 National Defense Authorization Act on the recommendations that each committee, com commission has submitted to Congress on the national security workforce. Today, commissioners from all three are joining us here on this virtual platform to discuss their work and recommendations strengthening the national security workforce. So with that, I would like to turn our attention to our first session. I'm gonna give you a bit of introduction about this session, and then I will uh, hand it over to the moderator. I will come back in throughout the session to introduce each of the sessions until finally we wrap up at the end. Our first session will explore processes for hiring in the federal government. These systems and policies must strike a, a balance between important priorities like fairness and flexible hiring or security and rapidity. In competitive hiring, markets like artificial intelligence and cybersecurity Finding this balance is especially difficult. In this session, representatives from the three commissions will discuss hiring authorities, the security clearance process, and other key issues that shape how the government brings talented individuals into public service positions. 
To moderate this conversation, we welcome Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy, Mr. Tom Wingfield. I've worked with Tom for many years, worked with him and for him and in his last role as Acting Chancellor of the College of Information in Cyberspace. So I know firsthand that these issues are really near and dear to his heart and he has committed himself to working to advance and strengthen our national security workforce. I'll turn it over now to Dazzy Wingfield. Thank you very much, Cassandra. I appreciate that. Um, I am Tom Wingfield, and I've got the honor to moderate the first panel this morning. Um, there we go. Uh, I'd like to introduce our three panelists and then go. We'll continue um, until we get to a question and answer period at the end. So to begin, uh, we are very lucky to have an impressive panel. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths. Uh, Commissioner for the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, also the president of Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota. Uh, she's had a distinguished academic career um, dipping in and out of government service, and she is lending her expertise to the AI Commission now. I had the pleasure of meeting her when I talked to the Commission several months ago, and I'm sure she'll have some interesting uh, things to say about what the Commission will recommend on the way forward for finding the right federal talent to make sure we don't lose track in this area. Second, second is Congressman James Langevin. Um, Chairman Langevin is uh, on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, and he chairs the Emerging Threats and Capabilities uh, Subcommittee. Um, I met him, of course, uh, during numerous events at NDU. As Admiral Rogge said, uh, NDU does attract some serious people from Washington, and he is certainly one of those. And I have the honor of working with him in my new capacity, um, reporting to his committee on Department of Defense cyber activities. So we're very glad that Chairman Langevin is here today. And last but not least is Ms. Sean Skelly. Now she's a commissioner on the Commission for the National, the uh, National Commission for uh, Military, National, and Public Service. The first commission of its kind with the, the broad sweep to address all forms of, of public service and motivating the, the best people to, to choose um, service to the United States. So with these three commissioners um, here, I would like to open up with the first question, and I'd like to start with Dr. Griffiths, if I could. Um, first question would be, um, all of your commissions have done significant work to move the ball forward in your respective mission areas. Um, Dr. Griffith, starting with you, could you tell us a little bit more about your work? Um, what are some of the major recommendations from your commission in the federal hiring process? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, last year, the NSCAI, in partnership with the Defense Innovation Board and Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, developed an AI workforce model. And the model breaks up the AI workforce into seven archetypes. They include strategic leaders, tactical leaders, end users, support roles, and three archetypes for the technical workforce. And our recommendations from our first quarter report focus on improving recruiting and hiring practices for this technical workforce and raising baseline AI literacy for end users, including for HR professionals. Our recommendations are based on the premise that if the government can't improve hiring practices, baseline knowledge, recruitment, and talent exchanges, it'll be a struggle to accomplish anything significant in AI. So our early recommendations, including target recruiting experts and developers, training end users, and identifying internal talent and educating those in support roles. So those are our, our, our basic, uh, they're very preliminary. They're the first set of recommendations we decided to make. We thought they represented some low hanging fruit and perhaps some foundational uh, changes that need to be made in the federal hiring and workforce development. Thank you very much. Chairman, Chairman Langevin, uh, if you wouldn't mind addressing the same question. Um, with the Cyber Solarium Commission, um, I, I was there with quite a few of your meetings. Um, how would you um, describe some of your major recommendations when it comes to federal hiring um, procedures? 
Well, thank you, uh, Desi Wingfield. I want to thank you for um, moderating today and and uh, for your work in, in cyber and uh, your work at the Pentagon. I, I deeply appreciate your service to the country. Uh, let me, um, you know, uh, thank everyone for, for having us here. I want to also, of course, thank uh, the, the College of Information and Cyberspace uh, for hosting us. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, I guess I'd start off by saying there's an irony uh, that, uh, that this esteemed group has been brought together by the CIC uh, to discuss the importance of a, of a strong uh, federal workforce uh, at a time when uh, CIC's existence is, is threatened. Uh, so um, this is... Um, uh, been a little bit frustrating to me, and I've been a bit uh, confounded by uh, uh, by the secretary, the Department of Defense, and the Joint Staff, and uh, really the, uh, the the leadership uh, at uh, at NDU's seeming determination to shut down nation's only graduate uh, level school dedicated to the cyber uh, workforce domain. So uh, I, I've communicated my concerns directly to the NDU president. Uh, we had a, you know, I thought a constructive dialogue, but, um, you know, uh, the, the plan to shut of the, the college continues from what I understand. So I, I just want to, I, I think it'd be appropriate for me to mention, and it'd be clear, Congress created CIC and, and Congress fully supports it. And in the coming weeks, I plan to introduce an amendment uh, to this year's NDAA that, that limits a significant percentage uh, of NDU's funding until Congress is assured uh, that CIC's full funding will be restored and that uh, that NDU will grow CIC's student body uh, and its graduates. So uh, I'm not going to uh, allow the nation to uh, uh, to lose this uh, inestimable uh, resource. I think it uh, brings great value to, uh, uh, to our national security. So uh, with that, let me just answer your, your question. Again, serving uh, on the Salarium Commission was really one of the, the highlights of my time uh, in, uh, in, in Congress. And, um, and uh, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's the, uh, the kind of exchanges that took place in Salarium, the exact type of exchanges that should take place in Congress don't often do, but this was really good give and take and good dialogue. Um, and uh, Dazdi Winfield, I have to say, you know, I, I thank you for your uh, participating again this morning and uh, uh, in, in your role at uh, at uh, DOD and uh, uh, NDU uh, it, it's, uh, for hosting us today. Uh, so um, the Salarium Commission basically is set up to address two big uh, questions. Uh, what strategic approach uh, will defend the United States against cyber attacks of significant consequence? And, and what policies and, um, uh, and legislation are required to, to implement the, the strategy. So we had some real productive, uh, again, discussions and meaningful work that came out of it. We identified the need to grow the cyber workforce really as a critical part of our government's ability to deter malicious activity in cyberspace. And uh, I'm often fond of saying that the, the, the best policies or procedures in the world are really nothing about the people to implement. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight a, couple, highlight a couple of examples that I think are really important to building up is this cadre of cyber professionals. They both um, uh, involve capacity building and the opportunity uh, for, for learning, uh, which we know are key elements in uh, an engaged workforce. Um, for example, we propose to drastically expand the Cyber uh, Core uh, Scholarship for Service Program. I've been a big supporter of this, uh, of, of this program. Uh, it's graduated uh, about 3,600 students uh, into the government since it began in 2001. And um, we propose to expand that to 2,000 students per year. Uh, that's just as a start. Another recommendation, and this is where I'll, I'll, I'll end up here, uh, is the creation of a new uh, civil service cyber. So basically what we're trying to do here is create a system of established uh, cyber career paths that allows movement between departments and agencies into senior leadership positions. The, um, the civilian government has one of the biggest uh, and the largest uh, enterprise networks on the planet. And, uh, and we really need to do a better job of ensuring that everyone is on the, the, the same page, on the same team, if you will, uh, has access to training, has uh, room for career growth, 
uh, no matter which department uh, one is uh, directly supporting and be able to move within departments and agencies and know that everyone basically has the same level of training and skills so that uh, it, you can move seamlessly between departments and agencies. And again, you know, you're getting top notch talent with the same background and training. So uh, I'll stop there, but uh, growing the cyber workforce is essential. Thank you very much, Chairman Langevin. I appreciate that. Uh, on to Ms. Skelly, um, could you please just tell us, um, for all the work your commission has done, could you describe some of the key recommendations for the federal hiring process in cyber? Thank you, Desney Wingfield. Um, first, on behalf of our chair, uh, Dr. Joe Heck, and my uh, 10 other colleagues, one of which Deb Wada will be with us later on the second panel, thank you very much for having us here. Um, what I'd like to add, um, is um, it both um, Dr. Lewis and you um, explained some of our charter um, to um, what part of which to increase to consider methods to increase participation in military, national, and public service to address the national security and other public service needs of the nation. How we went about that, I think, is critical to anything anything I'll say and everything that uh, our recommendations contain. Is we went out across the country. Um, we were mandated to. Um, we held. 11 public hearings, uh, excuse me, 11 public meetings with the public where they could comment, 14 public hearings. Um, we visited 22 states, 42 cities, talked with thousands of people, 500 plus organizations. Um, so everything you see reflected here is informed by what the American people think of the federal government and what they see is how it works for them and their ability to be a part of it and to serve, their, serve themselves, serve the nation as public servants. Um, that was one of the real things that informs our public service recommendations. We looked at our entire charge through a rubric of uh, what we call the three A's, awareness, aspiration, and access. To get people into the federal government, they have to understand it, have to have an appreciation for it. And there are real barriers to that, which tie into our civic education and service learning recommendations, which wasn't in our charge, but we determine ourselves in large part due to speaking to average Americans across the country. They're like, you know, we there's civic education has gone by the wayside in public schooling. Um, and that factors into the impression of government and whether folks will try to be a part of the government as a public servant. Um, likewise, another barrier is with regard to um, aspiration and access there's not a good reputation amongst the public as to the ability to attain a federal job. USA Jobs has a, has a pretty poor reputation. Some of it earned, some of it legend. Um, and folks have experiences that have left them out there in the wind for months and if not years after applying for a job. Um, that contributes to a poor perception of the government and what it's like to be in it. Um, and the federal government's in direct competition with the civilian, the, the public greater economy, and it, it can find itself lagging in terms of time to hire. So a lot of our recommendations reflect a lot of what we heard back from individual citizens in terms of uh, decreasing time to hire, using authorities that are already on the books and many agencies do use, but are, they are not used across all agencies. And at the end of the day, this is about making it easier for people to bring their talents to the federal government. Ms. Skelly, um, I would like to uh, ask a, the next question. Do you think that um, for our three panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Griffiths, do you think that DOD and DHS need new authorities um, based on what Ms. Skelly just said, um, or do you think new authorities are required across the entire federal enterprise, that, it, that Congress needs to act to provide new authorities for the entire federal government? Uh, Dr. Griffiths, would you mind taking a whack at that? It certainly will, Mr. Griffiths. Thank you. Um, basically, we think that hiring authorities are, in a sense, a counterintuitive issue. Uh, many of the people we spoke with when we began our research assumed that the government needed to create new hiring authorities to address hiring and AI and we explored the existing authorities and spoke with hiring managers and human resource experts working in government and realized it isn't quite that simple. Um, in our interim report, we stated the US government has the vast majority of the authorities it needs to hire AI talent. Several authorities are especially relevant to improving the AI workforce. But agencies with a critical need can, in fact, shorten the hiring process using authorities specific to STEM fees especially direct hiring authorities and separate services. But as we heard um, from um, Charles Kelly, 
uh, many of those uh, authorities are underutilized, often be due to risk averse human resources teams that we believe play an outsized role in the vetting process and often rely on rather imprecise position descriptions rather than understanding the patient's technical requirements. In our first quarter recommendations, we recommended that the government tackle this in two ways. First, we recommended that the government expand the cyber acceptance service, which is the uh, 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 opportunity. And we explicitly believe that that should be expanded to include artificial intelligence positions. And we recognize that cyber and AI are different fields, but we believe the authorities in the cyber acceptance service system would benefit an AI workforce as well. And then related to that, um, back side of that is really, we believe that the government should establish training and certification programs for HR professionals involved in hiring the AI workforce that ensures familiarity with the organization's goals regarding AI, hiring practices outside of the competitive service, and baseline understanding of the AI and software development workforce. So while we recommended expanding cyber acceptance service, we did not at this point recommend that it apply to other areas of development. I understand. Um, Chairman Langevin, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the, the need for a broader view of, of cyber expertise in the federal service. If I could ask you to expand on that just a little bit. Um, dividing the Solarium Commission's um, recommendations when it comes to um, human talent, when it comes to that, what would you say are some of the most immediately actionable things that Congress can do? And what are some of the longer term things that might be a heavier lift that we may have to put off but still keep working toward? Um, could you Could you address that for us? Well, uh, you're talking about in terms of growing the, the cyber workforce, right? Yes, yes. Right. So, you know, we have to recognize that the, the, the federal government uh, really has a hiring problem, uh, period. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it really manifests in the, in the challenges that my staff in Rhode Island uh, have in helping Rhode Islanders get jobs through USA uh, uh, Jobs. Dot gov uh, and um, it shows uh, up in the the to get the difficulty that people have uh, moving in and out of government service and their ability to um, uh, and their inability to to uh, lateral in uh, or out for short uh, stints and uh, right, it's incredibly apparent and kind of a really important uh, really, uh, time that it takes to get security clearances so a number of challenges that we have to address. So fixing that uh, really is a, a task for you know uh, for me brighter minds than me. But I'll I will say that on the on the security front, uh, you know we spend uh, too much time in, in the federal government thinking about how to uh, to grow our slice of the the, the cyber workforce. And uh, you know uh, you know when when CISA hires an inspiring analyst uh, uh, who would otherwise go to Google, I, you know I find. That you know, really the country benefits, and I and I want to, you know, that that marginal cyber professional to work for the uh, the, the federal the federal government, and uh, you know I think that when that happens, because uh, we're in a deep hole, and I think everybody wins in the in the long term. But you know, the, in the long run, um, Google or, or some of the other, you know, the Microsoft, the, the other tech companies. They need good cyber analysts as well, and so the only way that um, that we fix that problem really is to grow the size of the pie itself. So that's why I'm a I'm a big fan of things like K through 12 education, uh, big fan of the cyber core program and expanding that, uh, bringing down the barriers to coming into the government and and working in in those areas uh, temporarily, uh, maybe for a time. I like the idea of cross-pollinization. I brought down barriers in DOD to allow the DOD to bring in cyber talent uh, or, or uh, outside talent for a period of time. And then also have DOD uh, individuals go and work in the private sector and kind of learn best practices in the private sector. Um, longer term, uh, we, we also need to look at a more creative program of, of um, a scholarship for service program for young people graduating high school and going into college and 
with the idea of, look, you go into a, uh, a, a cybersecurity curriculum program, uh, we, we pay for college and, and uh, or significantly help, say, in the, in the first couple of years. And then in return, uh, when you graduate, you work in, a, in government at the local, state, or federal level for a period of time. It's very similar to Cyber Core, but Cyber Core basically accepts uh, applicants for their junior and senior year basically pays their tuition for those years, gives a stipend of $22,500, and then when they graduate, they go into, they, they agree to, to work in, in local, state, or federal government in a cybersecurity position for two years. I'd like to start it, and this, by the way, this is an idea that Suzanne Spaulding, uh, formerly at DHS, uh, brilliant mind and one of the commissioners, so I want to give credit where credit's due because she was the one that really first put this on my radar, and so I applaud her creative thinking, we need to find a way to make that that happen. But we have to grow the size of the cyber workforce pie, uh, not just compete for a larger slice of it on the on the government side. Ms. Kelly, building on Chairman Langevin's comments, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that from your uh, work, you understand that Title V um, has a, a long history and it was designed to insulate the federal civil service from uh, political influence uh, to provide a certain amount of stability and security to attract and retain uh, qualified people. Um, what is your, your view or the Commission's view on how, how well Title V requirements can meet cyber requirements? Um, do you think there needs to be su significant work done on Title V to attract and retain the kind of people the government needs for, for cyber work? Thank you. Um, it feels like a cop out to say it, but I, I feel like my, my, um, the two previous panelists um, covered that, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll sum that up. Um, we've demonstrated the ability to hire highly talented people in a rapid manner, U.S. Digital Service, Defense Digital Service. Um, in, in other places. Um, it's accepting that, normalizing it, getting it to the right agencies and the right components of the right agencies, um, and, and ensuring that the culture understands that these things are not only usable, but they have to be used. Um, and also mentioned um, mobility in the workforce. The people that would want to, um, pardon, the, pardon the phrase, capture and bring into the federal service are also often the kind of people who are in that more or less gig economy who who have an who have an appreciation that they should be able to work at multiple places over the course of their career. If we can facilitate that on the back end, where they can leave and, and be found good standing and have the ability to come back in, um, we know how to get these people. We should also know how to get them back again. But I think the, the thrust is in practice over permission. Um, those permissions are out there. Um, we need to oversee their use a little better. We have recommendations in our commission's report about that. We also need to monitor their use to see their performance and normalize them. I don't think we have to blow up Title V. We've already cracked the code. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, when it comes to cyber, it seems that one of the long poles in the tent is the security clearance process. Um, the government, even beyond the world of cyber, uh, is sometimes challenged to get the, the right number of people through a security clearance process in a timely fashion. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Griffiths, first off, uh, did your commission look at that at all? And did you have any recommendations or any thoughts on ways we can perhaps attack the, the clearance process uh, a little more aggressively in order to uh, capture people and to, to move them into federal service more quickly in, in sensitive positions? Thank you very much. Um, it's one of my favorite questions. Um, having uh, uh, witnessed and been part of the security clearance process and seeing our students trying and our faculty trying to get through the process, but the Commission certainly did look at this. Um, the challenge that's posed by the security clearance process is a consistent theme with every group we speak with, especially for those who are trying to hire people from the private sector. Um, AI practitioners hired by the government often face long wait times before they can start work. And during this wait period, some early career practitioners instead choose to move to the private sector where they can begin working and accessing data and models much more quickly. And later career practitioners already in the private sector may also therefore choose to stay there rather than explore options in the government. 
worth noting that it's getting better. Um, let's be fair, the Office of Personal Management cut the investigation backlog from 750,000 to 200,000, which was accompanied by shorter investigations. Control of the security clearance process shifted last year to the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, and they plan to reduce the time required for a top secret clearance to 80 days and for a secret clearance to 40 days, which uh, while that's a significant improvement, um, an 80-day wait still may not put the government still may put the government at a disadvantage compared with private sector employees, um, particularly companies that are hiring high-demand AI experts. So, in our first quarter recommendations, we recommended that the government allow some senior leaders to prioritize personnel hired under the Cyber Acceptance Service and for artificial intelligence, data science, and software development positions during the security clearance process and set a standard that they have an interim secret clearance within 20 days and an interim top secret clearance within 30 days. And we understand that's a contentious recommendation um, as most leaders think they're subject matter experts and leaders should be a high priority. But there's a strong case that AI and some other digital talent genuinely and uniquely require prioritization. First is the small number of AI practitioners both in the United States and around the world, and the degree of skills it requires. So AI is uniquely a talent development uh, dependent field. And as um, my Congress... ...for AI practitioners is extremely high in competitive. Uh, AI practitioners that put their work on hold for months at a time to wait for security clearance can and sometimes do, sim do simply turn to the private sector and are quickly hired at salary that the government simply can't match. And third, senior leaders, including the Secretary of Defense and the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, have made AI their leading technology priority, but their departments and agencies have been unable to hire the talent they need to implement AI. We did make a related recommendation, which is to develop facilities where employees waiting on national security clearances can actually perform unclassified work until they receive a clearance. So that would sort of give them an interim place where they're actually working for the federal government, but not necessarily fully cleared. So those were a number of, I think, fairly aggressive recommendations we made in our first quarter report on security. Thank you. I appreciate that, that thoughtful answer to the question. There's a lot of work to be done in the clearance area. And you've laid it out extremely clearly. Um, I think now we should move to the question and answer part of our um, program. And I am going to uh, attempt to do this technologically. I will ask my, my technological overseers control um, to, to step in in case there's a problem. But I would like to... Um, Set first question um, from Jan Hamby, former chancellor of the College of Information and Cyberspace. Uh, this question, uh, the workforce is trending toward uh, careers that play out across many different companies without a person taking, um, without a, person taking uh, a job and staying, staying that, with the job with that company for their full work life. They're not doing that. How can the future of the national security workforce acknowledge and adapt to that so that people can move back and forth between not just different parts of the federal um, of federal service, but between federal service and the private sector? Um, would any of our um, panelists like to take a whack at Admiral Hamby's question? Yeah, I'd like to uh, go back to answering that, and I, I touched on it. Already, I completely agree uh, with the the, uh, the person who asked the question. We need more on ramps and off ramps, and be able to come into uh, federal service for time, uh, work in the private sector, and when uh, you know talent needs rise, especially for specific projects, be able to come back in and uh, and and work in the in the in the in the federal government uh, without you know. Um, the you know the bureaucracy or the paperwork to do, you know that that hinders coming back in and out for you know for short periods of time. Um, certainly, hiring authorities are are important. Uh, you know, for DHS, for DOD, I've certainly championed uh, cyber accepted service at DOD, and I've supported enhanced authorities at uh, DHS. Um, you know, but. Uh, 
again, we still have the issue of having to grow the uh, the, the the cyber pie, and uh, but it would be uh, it, it encouraging. I think everyone is well served by allowing uh, these easier on ramps and off ramps to to be able to transition in and out of the federal government uh, for a time, as opposed to uh, making it more difficult. If I could chime in there, please. Please. Um, one of our recommendations um, plays into this with regard to um, creating essentially a, a cyber reserve of folks who have served in uh, DOD and DHS. Um, we believe that um, just as the chairman just said, um, we have to grow the pie and grow the number of people who are capable of, of uh, who have these skills. Um, when the federal government does that, contributes to their certifications and their in their technical experience, and they need to. Um, and want to move on, we should not, we, the federal government, should not lose touch of them. Um, we should, uh, akin to an IRR, um, they go back out into the world, they continue with their professional life, they may look to come in or we may need to call them back um, in a way so that we can maintain their clearance at a minimal cost and keep them in touch. And if we can pull them back or they want to come back, we know who they are, who they are that they're still cleared for certain people that we want to keep cleared and that uh, that should ease that process as well. Thank you, Skill. I appreciate that. Uh, we have a, another question. Um, this one concerns unions. Um, one listener um, asks, federal employee unions strongly oppose many of the recommendations of your commissions uh, to bring in new graduates for public-private talent exchanges, uh, to put modern personnel systems in place, et cetera. Um, how do you think that, uh, first, do you think that's a problem? And second, if it is, how can we balance the equities of unions protecting their membership with the need to move beyond 20th century hiring? Would anyone like to address that? Well, I can, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I don't have all the answers, but I do believe that we have to uh, sit down and have conversations with unions and understand their concerns. I think this has been an issue over the last 20 or 30 years as technology has played an increasing role in what we do in government and, and in the private sector. And I think uh, uh, really trying to understand why there are concerns, where there are concerns, what are the most critical concerns is, is the way we need to go. Um, I understand we're just starting that process, having heard from the uh, unions um, about our first quarter recommendations. So I'm sure we'll be Understand. Thank you. Um, I would like to take a moderator's privilege here and insert um, a question uh, from a, a not privileged conversation I had with the commander of U.S. Cybercom, General Nakasone. Something he said in public several times when he's asked what his number one requirement is, is talented people. He says he has a lot, but he needs a lot more. And when people drill down on that question for him, he says it's not simply a matter of more numbers, but he says um, perhaps uniquely in the cyber field that uh, there is a certain kind of employee who might be 10 or 20 times more capable than the people to the left or the right, that there's a huge talent spread and that getting one of those extremely special highest performers um, could, could do more for a mission than an entire section of normal employees. So with that, that's really not the model the federal government uses for, for, filling, uh, for filling slots. Would any commissioner like to address um, what your commitment uh, as, as a requirement for the, the highest level talent and how perhaps we can move not just beyond moving the general baseline for hiring, but maybe some creative ideas for attracting these supremely talented individuals that could make a very big difference. Anyone? Uh, we had one recommendation on the NSCAI um, that relates to this, which and we were thinking in terms of the hot shot high school graduate who's done work for code.org, has perhaps done some work with a local startup and really has a tremendous amount of talent but doesn't fit into the hiring uh, process uh, and requirements of the federal government at the moment. So we recommended the use of portfolio reviews. Um, this is becoming very, very common in higher education. Uh, you have a portfolio of your best work. 
demonstrates what you're capable of doing. Um, and we think that that might be a way for the government to start assessing the capability of these, some, these very highly talented individuals. I could also add, sir, um, the digital services um, are, are, I think, in doing that, um, it's it, some of our recommendations pertain to um, getting the uh, the human capital workforce better involved in the process from a leadership position and training that workforce. Um, but also, our recommendations can um, consider getting the um, the subject expert hiring manager more involved in that overall process. And that's what the, the digital services have done. Um, General Nakasone's person who's 12 or 15 times better than, than their left and right. Well, we do have some of those people in the fold and they know what those people look like and can validate those people as the ones to be brought on board. So having those experts, how are experts involved in that process able to yeah, pardon my pardon my code. Speak their language to convince them that they are recognized and will be valued inside the system is a way that we can get after that. And I think that applies to any other talent, whether it be you know civil engineering or environmental science. We have to use they've 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 done it. Um, we have to we have to upgrade it and and distribute it across the government. Yeah, I I'd like to chime in and just say that. You know, we need creative recruiting uh, options here and and uh, being able to bring in that that top level talent. Uh, you know, you mentioned General Nakasone and uh, we need that uh, more that type of creative thinking. Uh, for those who want familiar, I, I give credit to General Nakasone's innovative recruiting ads that uh, they've developed when he was at our cyber. And uh, if you know, if you paused uh the the ad on uh, on youtube you you could see a link uh, uh on screen that would take you to to a uh, uh to a series of challenges culminating in a uh in a recruiter's uh, email address so uh, just one example of you know of, of creativity and trying to bring in that 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 cyber talent and we need flexibility and creativity for uh cyber recruiters so yeah it's a it's an important point. I appreciate that. We're getting close to the end of our time, so I would like to put out for each panelist. We'll start with Dr. Griffiths. So you've got just a moment's warning before I, I throw it to you. Um, if we uh, in the audience today are quite a few people from government, from industry, from the military. Uh, so this is an excellent moment to get some important ideas out. If, if we had the people that had their hands on the levers of making this happen within the executive branch, they're tuning in and they're listening and they want to know the, the one or two main takeaways, the thing to pass to their bosses to maybe start for a legislative proposal to Congress or to do things for which they already have the authorities in their departments. Dr. Griffiths, and I'll ask each panelist to close with, with this question, what one or two key takeaway points would you want that decision maker to know about what we need to do differently for hiring, especially with respect to your commission's um, conclusions? Dr. Griffiths? Thank you. I'll try and make it pithy. It's a long mm -hmm. question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is, I apologize. Always done and assume that they're going to make a different response. So I think that one of the things that's very, very important is to rebalance the relationship between HR professionals, hiring managers, and organizational leaders. So there's a better understanding of what the requirements uh, of the positions are and a better way of identifying talent, either from within or from outside into the process. I think that's one piece. I do think the second piece is we've got to address the length of time uh, for security clearances. That's, that's very, very critical. We're losing people to the private sector very quickly. The other thing I would say, which we've talked to a, a number of people in the private sector, um, and we have found that many young people who've gone to work for the private sector are really um, excited about projects, really uh, inspirational projects, the opportunity to work on something that they wouldn't otherwise be able to work on. And I think the government needs to develop some inspirational messages of that kind and then be able to bring in people even on a temporary basis. 
come and work on this project for a while and then go back. And we believe that we can uh, build the pool of talent uh, a little bit more quickly that way, as well as reaching down um, into the K-12 pipeline and trying to accelerate from the pipeline into the workforce. So there are a number of things in that. Thank you very much, Dr. Griffiths. I'd like to go next to Ms. Skelly. Um, what, what few takeaways would you want to make sure that the, the decision maker listening to you now would, would carry back and perhaps actually take for action? Thank you. And I'm going to steal from Dr. Griffiths um, a little bit. Um, she mentioned about the, the excitement for projects. I think it's about messaging. The American public is insufficiently informed as to what their government does for them and how it gets done. It gets done through people and that it's possible for them, their children, their nieces and nephews to be a part of that. Um, we, compete with, we compete with the economy writ large. Um, we can't compete on compensation. We can do the, our best to make the benefits compatible. Um, where we win or have the advantage is on the mission, just as the doctor described. Um, to communicate that message, we have to cross the barrier of awareness. Um, we make some recommendations about there needs to be increased authorization and permission for agencies to get out there and do general awareness campaigns, education campaigns. The first point of contact with a prospective civil servant should not be USA Jobs, um, nor necessarily a recruiter looking to land them as an employee for a specific seat. We need to do a better job of communicating. So if leaders can go out there and move fast and kind of break things with it within the law and get their message out to colleges, universities, communities, whether they be physical communities or the virtual communities of interest that are out there, that's an opportunity to increase the chance that you'll get the people that you're looking for. I understand. Thank you, Ms. Skelly. And uh, we'll close with Chairman Langevin. Uh, sir, uh, you've taken a leadership role from Congress to do what can be done from the legislative branch. Uh, what would your takeaway message be, say, for those listening in the executive branch about what should be done sooner rather than later, um, concrete steps that we can take uh, more or less immediately to, to improve our ability in this area? Chairman? Yeah. I, I would say, uh, given the executive branch, go make friends with people in the Department of Education uh, because what we really need is to, some, again, continued focus on growing uh, the cyber workforce, and it really starts with uh, with education. And I have to say, the Israelis do this much better than we do. Uh, they have a robust cyber education program, K uh, through 12. Uh, cybersecurity there is is a forethought, not an afterthought. Uh, we need to model that same thing here. Um, e even starting with educating uh, from the very youngest ages about uh, practicing good cyber hygiene. Right, uh, that we need. A, I've often said we need a Smokey the Bear campaign for only you can prevent uh, fire forest fires, only you can uh, prevent uh, uh, cyber intrusions. So uh, let let's start there. Number one, that grows, uh, it, it instills stronger cybersecurity uh, from early an early age. But then you think about uh, educating the young people about this as a potential career. And I've already given highlights about Cyber Core, and that's just a kind of a, a small uh, step in growing the workforce. We need to do more. But, um, and by the way, um, I, I would say um, looking at uh, a, a reskilling uh, of our workers towards cyber uh, education and, and cyber careers right now, especially in, in the current environment when unemployment right now is at historically high levels. Uh, we recently released a pandemic uh, Annex, uh, we're calling it a Panex, where we call for the federal agencies to rapidly develop and deploy apprenticeship programs uh, for cyber roles focused on uh, on reskilling unemployed Americans to fill critical cybersecurity workforce gaps. Uh, but it it really it, it comes uh, down to to education and um, even even looking at uh, educating uh, people in career and tech fields and. Uh, people that install uh, OT equipment, uh, for example, you know that operational technology. That um, if you have uh, default passwords as the as the password, as opposed to uh, changing that when it's installed from the beginning, uh, we're leaving a, again a, a big vulnerability there. So um, again, educating the uh, the installers and and again uh, growing the the cyber uh, workforce by 
uh, by ramping up our education programs are the best way to go to growing cyber talent and ultimately hopefully bring them into the federal government as well as the private sector. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'd like to thank our, we're now at the end of our time. So before I turn it back to Dr. Lewis, um, I would like to thank each of our panelists for their very thoughtful, um, detailed answers. Dr. Griffiths, Ms. Skelly, uh, Chairman Langevin, thank you very much for uh, your time today and the thought you put into this. Um, you've given us a lot to think about and maybe a few things to take for action. So thank you very much. Uh, Cassandra, over to you. So much, Dasdy Wingfield, and to all of our panelists, thank you for a, um, a really engaged discussion. Um, as an educator, I know that uh, what I can say is that what I heard was just actually music to my ears, just wonderful affirmation of the importance of education across the spectrum from the very earliest to um, what we do at CIC, which is graduate le level strategic education. So definitely music to our ears. Um, so let's turn our attention next to our, um, the following on uh, session will focus on tools the U.S. government has established to help bring talented individuals into government jobs. Programs like CyberCore, Scholarship for Service, the Pathways Internship, and other recruiting tools have a strong track record of success and can be expanded to improve to help address critical workforce needs. To moderate this session on these important opportunities to expand and strengthen these types of tools for federal hiring, we welcome Dr. Laura Juner, who is the director of um, INSS at NDU, which is the Institute of National Strategic Studies. Dr. Juner, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Well, I'd like to briefly introduce our panel, beginning with um, Dr. Griffiths, who was so generous with her time to, to join us for another panel and will um, continue representing the findings of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. In addition, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Chris Inglis. Chris is a former uh, Deputy Director of the National Security Agency and currently serving as the Looker Distinguished Visiting Professor of Cyber Studies at the Naval Academy. And he's here today to represent the um, finding and experiences of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And then um, finally, Deb Wada, um, who I have had the pleasure to serve with for several years now. Um, Deb serves as the Vice Chair of the National Commission on Military, National, and Public Service. And from 2014 to 2017, she served as the Army's um, Assistant Secretary of Manpower for Reserve Affairs. Um, and prior to that has a long distinguished history um, supporting personnel um, programs and policies on the HASC. So all of you welcome. Um, I'd like to start out with sort of an opening question um, and I'll pose it, it's for all of you and we'll, we'll go through in the order with which you were introduced. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is that the, the competition for talent, for STEM talent is pretty fierce. Um, there's there's a lot of public sector demand and other private sector demands um, for this talent. And typically in areas where there are such valuable skill sets, the pathway programs that, that um, Cassandra described are used to kind of draw in talent, you know, provide, typically they provide some type of um, pecuniary um, uh, scholarship or fellowship in return for a, um, uh, uh, a commitment to serve um, in a government national security position. Um, will you walk me through what your each of your um, commissions looked at, uh, at least indirectly, this marketplace? Um, can you describe what your um, commission found in terms of the issues of uh, government competing for this talent and the efficacy of these path pathways programs. And if your commission had other recommendations, um, either along these lines or similar, um, please talk about them as well. So beginning with Dr. Griffiths. Okay, thank you very much. And on to another subject, but a very important part of strengthening the AI workforce. Um, we uh, started off by recognizing, we, we did a, a sort of had an early process of trying to find out what the current state of the 
affairs is, and we found that the government's been slow to recognize the importance of expanded AI skills and expertise, and is struggling basically to attract, develop, organize, and retain an AI ready workforce. So that was the basis. Um, and we found that was because of bureaucratic barriers in hiring, slow security clearance processes, not enough in house expertise, etc. So last year, as I mentioned in the first panel, but I'll repeat it because it's an important um, basic point. We worked with the Defense Innovation Board and the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center to develop a model of the AI workforce. So if we're going to look at strengthening the workforce, what does that mean? Uh, who are the people that we need in the workforce at what level? And what kinds of capabilities do we need to have in the different areas of the workforce? So that model is actually guiding our, our workforce efforts in the NFA. I just wanted to mention that. I have in the first panel talked about the seven different archetypes from strategic leaders down to um, the technical workforce and uh, end users and support roles. So our first point of recommendations were addressed to make it easier for government to bring in the talent they need. We did look at the Cyber Course Fellowship for Service Program, which is an excellent program, and uh, we recommended expanding that to include artificial intelligence. Recognizing again that cyber and AI are two different fields, but rather than say, let's develop another scholarship for service program, let's leverage the existence of one and it also have a little of track in it. We also looked at the Corey's internship program, um, and we believe that that also is, um, is a, a good program, but many agencies are struggling to use it to, uh, to its full potential um, for a number of reasons concerned about the, uh, the caps. So when they open the application windows, they're often filled within minutes and many students are unable to, um, to participate in the program. The second is um, second challenge is a reliance on uh, OPM qualification standards. The challenge is the difficulty interns face when they try to convert to a full-time service position. So we made specific recommendations addressing those three areas, removing the caps, um, shortening, uh, shortening the length of the uh, completion of hours in the internship so that they can convert to a permanent position much more quickly. So um, we, we addressed those two areas we think show a great deal of promise but need some tweaking to make them relevant to the artificial intelligence workforce. Mr. Inglis. Thanks, Laura. It's a great question. Um, so the Solarian Commission, not unlike the others, um, kind of gave a lot of time and attention to the workforce issues. Um, and, and I would say we would offer the following. Um, like everyone has said, we need to have a bigger pie. Um, that means you need to essentially address the talent problem as early as possible. K through 12 is not too soon. So there needs to be awareness. There needs to be a presentation of cyber as an option. Cyber is an interesting option. Uh, for kids that would not, other, not otherwise be contacted with that. Um, you need to have a more expansive view about what the cyber talent needs are too often. We think about people who literally have a technical degree at the bachelor or the bachelor's level. Um, it, it's not just at those kind of archically um, exalted levels, but it's horizontally in many other disciplines. And so there can all many huge approach, which is a very few people need to have literally the word cyber in their job title. Uh, many uh, professionals need to know something more about cyber in order to properly do their job as lawyers, as system engineers, mechanical engineers. Um, those, those are folks who essentially educate children K through 12. Um, and then everyone needs to have a degree of cyber awareness that today they don't. Congressman Langevin spoke earlier about a defensive driving force for students in cyberspace. Um, how do you actually unleash students um, when they're going to be on the front line of the cyber skir skirmishes? Um, with anything less than some cyber um, kind of skills. Finally, um, there are some very specific programs that you can uh, harness that uh, create the curricula, the, uh, the regimen that a broad army of teachers and institutions are hungry for, but they can't, they don't know how to develop them themselves. And so the Centers for Academic Excellence, sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security, the National Security Agency, that's very useful in that regard. Um, I would mention three other things quickly. Um, second, um, we need to not apologize um, for what the federal government offers as its jobs, but perhaps be inspiring and enthusiastic about that. The mission that the federal government does is unique, it's interesting, it's exciting. Um, you can actually do a career in the federal government with a great amount of enthusiasm. 
So we need to sell not just, just the job, but the careers. We need to sell the mission, not the, perhaps the salary or the opening position. Um, we need to have some flexible use cases across boundaries. The Solarian Commission recommended that we not simply import people from the private sector for short tours, integrated tours, but we do the reverse. We allow people from the federal government to go to the private sector without essentially taking them to the edge of the property and kind of moving all of their buttons and breaking their sword. They need to actually be welcomed. So we need to redefine what the concept of retention is. You're working in a lateral agency with an expectation to be welcomed back with open arms and more likely to come. And then finally, we need to identify options to augment the federal workforce uh, with adjacent sectors. Um, traditionally, we think about the National Guard in that, in that, uh, that case, but we we'll also think about the private sector more broadly, about are there folks in the private sector that in contingencies or crises would perhaps sign up in advance to say, I'd like to help in something like that. That actually creates relationships in peacetime that are useful to all sides, and it makes it more interesting to be in a career. Um, I think we actually have a sense that uh, this is not a single dimension issue, despite the fact that the thread seems to revolve around people. People have many and varied attributes and interests, and we need to address them all. All right, Ms. Water. Outside of my home. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear me. But, um, the commission took a look at a number of issues, right? From how do we improve a pathways program for interns coming in, creating sort of a public service ROTC core, um, and looked at it holistically. And we have a number of recommendations that we had included in our um, report. But I want to take it a different way because I think holistically, when you step back, there's a couple of things that we found. We found that the um, particularly in Generation Z. They want to be part of something bigger. They want, we have to, uh, from the federal government or any government level, have to have a message of the value proposition of working for the government has that resonates among Gen Z, um, a young American today. On top of that, um, it's hard for the young people of America to understand what their government does because what we found as a commission, and we didn't even look for it because it was brought to us, was the lack of civic education. So when you compare STEM education right now in our schools, we spend $54 per student and five cents on civic education. So if a young American does not understand what the value proposition of working for the government and our mission and what we do and how we improve lives across this country and across the world really truly is, then it's hard for them and us as a government entity to go to them and say, come work for us. We have these amazing missions that you know you can help change your community and the world or the nation. But if they don't understand what we do, why we do it, and what the value is to them as both individuals, but also to their communities and to our country, then we lose that game. And I think in all the recommendations that the commission has, um, all three commissions that we have, are, are probably very similar in nature, right? We need, we know the system is broken. We know that there are pockets of great programs that are working. Um, there are things that we can do to try to, to improve what we currently have. But I think if we don't change our mindset and how we approach the problem, then we only see the same things. And part of that is changing the culture and how we look at issues. We know that the departments have the tools and they have the authorities to do some of the things they want to do or um, they express to the Congress that they would like to do. Um, and given those tools, then they sort of, uh, there's nothing past go. Right. We've got this tool now and it's great. Thanks. But thanks where we've got it now and but we don't see any improvement. So I think if we look holistically at the problem, step back and look more, I think, um, in terms of what other issues is affecting this besides the technical problems that need to be fixed in the program, then we can create sort of this interest in why you should come work for government. Why is it important that we need people with the tech skills and the cyber skills to be able to come into the government to do the work that is important, not just for our country, but for the world and for our communities. So 
I, so let, let me let me um, continue that thought for a second. These um, these pathways programs um, to include CyberCore um, are work to try to to pull people in. But as Deb um, described, if 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 you don't catch them on the other end, um, I so I when I was in OSD, I was in charge of the NSAT program, which is a very similar program. It's a pathway for um, for folks that speak critical national security languages. And what we had all the authorities we need. We had a uh, we had a pathway program just like um, the ones we're talking about today, and we were attracting actually really really good talent. And we got them there. They went. They did their fellowships. They completed their education. And now it's time for them to serve. And full stop. <laughs> full stop. Uh, trouble getting um, the security clearances, which we we beat that horse in the last panel, so we don't have to beat that one again. But we got we got up to the point where it's time for them to serve and they can't find a job because the department, um, at least DOD, had a really hard time using the authorities that it was given. Um, so there was a, an education issue on part of the myriad of decentralized HR offices around the department. So, so I bring this, I, I, I throw this, um, this frustrating problem at your feet and, and I'm going to ask you one question. If you could change anything about the, um, the uh, manpower processes, the personnel systems, what would you change to make this easier? Are you starting with me? <laughs> okay, we can start with you. <laughs> um, you know, that's oh, a hard, I have a thought on that. <laughs> that's a hard question to answer, Laura, because I, I, I mean, I get the one part. And I guess if I was forced to choose one is culture has a lot to play with it. Um, and so changing culture so that um, the entire organization understands and those that we are trying to reach out understand and that we are transparent in what we are doing, I think will help go a long way. Um, but as you know, in large organization, culture barriers are the hardest to change and you can't legislate it. Um, it takes strong leadership and it takes it constant engagement to be able to have those hard discussions about what needs to be done to be able to change where we are. And, um, and uh, yeah, I guess I refer to my fellow colleagues on the panel. <laughs> Cousin Marie or Chris, do you have a thought? I was, I was going to jump in and say, I absolutely agree. I had, I had thought that we need to overcome the resistance to change. And we need to have people understand the capabilities of the authorities and programs that currently exist um, and perhaps extend them a little bit more so that they are a little bit more flexible and address the needs that clearly the, uh, the government has in the workforce. But it, it's very, very hard to change people's minds, even about what the future brings and what from, from our commission's perspective, what artificial intelligence will bring. Um, you know, the people who still think you know, it's, it's bad. There are people who think it's high and sky sci-fi still, and there are people within the government and the middle and military who fully understand how this is going to change definitions of how we uh, how we engage with our adversaries and, and with our allies. Um, and how do you how do you change this throughout the service? I mean, it's it's very very hard, as you said. So we have um, I have a favorite recommendation, which is we really need to build AI literacy and awareness through the enterprise of, of the federal government. People need to know what AI is, what it's capable of, what its limitations are, and I think that's an important factor. Mm -hmm. And then the importance of data collection and data management in the service of artificial intelligence. If we did it just that, we build a better understanding. And uh, I agree with everything that we just heard on um, the issue of an exciting mission and spreading the, getting the message out that there are some really exciting and important uh, roles to play in the federal government and in the military. You can just reach them. But waiting until they're in university is too late. They're already on the pathway before they come to the university. So we really have to reach down at least to mid school, if not all the way back to the government. 
All right, I have time for one more question. Actually, can, <laughs> can I make a contribution here, which is that if yes. I had one thing, I would say that uh, human resources, security, and the management teams or the line operations that they would serve need to be part of the same team. We cannot think of this as a sequential process where you identify a candidate, maybe that's HR, you present them to the line managers, the operational organization, they say yes or no, and then finally you kick it over to security. They need to think up front about holistically, how do we address this person with all of those dimensions in mind and act with agility in finding and, and, and oozing and bringing that person into the organization. When that happens, there's no legal boundary. When that happens, you find a very agile, very forward-leaning hiring process. When it doesn't, um, you get USA jobs. Yeah, and, and, and I absolutely agree with that. When the hiring teams, when the personnel systems become part of the um, the, the organization's uh, uh, mission, then I think imperatives are are more easily understood. And some of these hiring authorities that for some reason look so reluctant start becoming a solution and not just um, something to be averted. Um, I think I am about out of time. Um, so I, I will place us in the trusty hands of our mysterious technological moderators for some questions. All right, um, this is from a CIC student. And it disappeared. Can you send me the question again? I sure can. I can also read it off if that helps. That would be great. <laughs> Perfect. From Lieutenant Colonel Jake Portaro, the CSC recently published lessons from the pandemic in a white paper, with one finding being the importance of education for the cyber workforce. How specifically is that effort being prioritized in light of our new COVID environment al alongside so many other competing priorities? And how are the other commissions adapting to the pandemic policy-wise? Uh, you know, thanks for the question. Um, I'll take that. Perhaps the other commissioners might have something to add. Um, CSC did write a pandemic act annex. Um, we, we essentially tee that up, not because the pandemic has a cyber component, but, but we believe that it's a sibling to the cyber problem. It's, a, it's, an, it's an analog to the cyber problem. Um, this is an event of great consequence that is eminently predictable, maybe not in time and place, but we can imagine that it will occur. And therefore, preparation um, you know, is the thing that um, you have to double down on if you're going to be able to address it when it does. Um, we also decided um, as a commission, not like, not unlike the others, that um, this is not simply a technology issue, that, that this is strongly a people issue, that you have to actually get the people part right, you have to get the technology part right, and you have to get the connections between them, which ultimately creates um, a cultural mandate. You have to get all of that right in order to be properly resilient, properly robust, and to then manage the crisis coherently as that. With respect to the cyber workforce, I'm kind of taking um, all of what's been said, you know, before, right to heart, um, we in the pandemic annex say that this is all the more important, therefore, to make sure that we've got the talent, it's got the muscle memory, it's got the diverse set of skills um, going into a crisis, and that it's joined up. We had one more thing, um, that, that in the case of cyber, unlike a pandemic, you actually, in the case of cyber, have an active adversary um, who's not going to simply hack the infrastructure or the data within that infrastructure, they're going to hack you. They're going to conduct an influence campaign. Uh, that makes critical thinking skills all the more important. We need to invest strongly in the foundation of critical thinking as much or more and perhaps those skills that ride on top of that that have to do with artificial intelligence or cyber specific or perhaps a yearn to, to serve publicly. If we're not investing in K through 12 in critical thinking skills, then we'll find our workforce, whatever their kind of purpose to do, is simply not ready um, to kind of handle that strain. Can I jump in and add to that from the NFC Absolutely. perspective? Um, actually, uh, everything emerged um, right after our first quarter report, which came out in March. Um, and we immediately started having uh, uh, conversations about the impacts of the pandemic on AI and AI on, on the pandemic. And in uh, May, in early May, we, uh, we, we published um, our first white paper called Privacy and Ethics Recommendations for Computing Applications developed to mitigate COVID-19. These are looking at making sure that any AI applications 
are implemented in a fair and unbiased way, etc. And AI could help um, address um, biases um, and disparities in the healthcare uh, system, etc. The second, um, uh, the second white paper was issued on May 22nd, and that was mitigating economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and preserving U.S. strategic competitiveness. Both those white papers are available on our website, nhcpan.gov. We, we jumped in, sort of, they're not specifically just workforce issues, but I wanted to mention them because I have a question. Okay. I should say workforce issues are just one part of what our commission was talking about, um, but it was quite interesting to find that most of the other areas um, of uh, review, for example, R&D or international competitiveness, or working with our allies, all said the workforce is very, very critical to anything that we might recommend. And so uh, the workforce um, developed quite a, quite a set of the first set of recommendations. All right. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? We do, and I'm happy to read it out. Okay. From Commander Colin Sopko. Cyber attacks are expected to, to increasingly be used as proxy conflicts between smaller countries, funded and enabled by large nations looking to consolidate and extend their spheres of influence, as seen in the recent cyber operations against Iran, following attacks on Saudi Arabia's oil facilities. How are we positioning the USG cyber workforce to meet the challenges and opportunities of these new gray zone proxy skirmishes alongside our allies? Yeah, so I'll start off. When, um, from the solarium, the cyberspace solarium mission's perspective, um, we believe that um, our ability to counter cyber activities directly, cyber on cyber, it's important, but, but it's essential um, and, and insufficient at the same time. But, but we need to have a whole of society, a whole of um, a nation approach, and frankly, arm in arm with other um, like-minded nations. So we need to apply legal remedies, diplomatic remedies, educational remedies to prepare the technology and the people to join up such that in this gray zone activity, which I think is quite, quite properly characterized in the question, um, where it's short of armed conflict, um, that we still prevail because we're essentially uh, making it such that any adversary in this space that insidiously and incrementally tries to erode right, our resilience on our side has to deal with all of us. The individuals, the organizations, the sectors, private, public, the government's floor will all join up. Um, that is going to require some amount of education in the civics component, which has been a hot topic, I think, in this uh, discussion for all the right reasons. As much or more as a requirement to have people who are cyber savvy and understand the details of the technology. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jose Maria or Deb, did you have a thought on that one? We're focused on AI, not, not so much that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Absolutely. And this speaks to your prior point, Dr. Juner, about the uh, National Security Education Program. Um, Recently, Lieutenant Gen General Shanahan in a CSIS website suggested that treating personnel with software coding skills like we treat personnel with foreign language skills may be an option. Any thoughts on whether some of those pathways may continue to be useful? I'd like to jump in. Yes, we do believe that coding skills um, should be recognized and should be uh, rewarded and we should be identified. So um, we have the same thing uh, just as uh, the language skills. Coding should be uh, included as well. The only other thing I would add to that is we think, in addition to coding, computational thinking is as important as coding, and it's not the same thing. So some people are very good at coding, other people are very, very good at computational thinking, which is an approach to problem solving. So we had recommended that um, the ASVAB, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, include a computational thinking um, so that we can assess that as quickly as possible. The Commission's view is quite consistent with that. We've gone so far as to say in uh, in proposed legislation that there should be the cyber occupational specialty, Office of Personnel Management, responsible for managing that. NIST, the National Institute for Standards Technology, would define that. 
but but create a wedge, some space, so that we can actually advance right that talent, that discipline, alongside all the others that are necessary to promote. Thank you, Dr. All right. All right. So um, I leave it up. Do we have time for one more question? We have two minutes. Then it would be a short question. <laughs> Do we have a short question? Are there any closing comments or additions from the other commissioners who are presenting? jump in. I, I, think I did want to explain that um, the uh, recommendations that I've been talking about today are simply our first quarter recommendations from the, uh, on the work strengthening the AI workforce. We have three more quarters of recommendations to evolve. So um, everything I've been talking about is not the end point. And um, we, uh, we believe that uh, actually the question that we're asking right now is whether incremental changes are going to be sufficient to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. And so we intend to address that exact question in the coming months. So I just wanted to give you a teaser there that the NSCI will continue to produce recommendations over the next nine months to a year and a few support forward. But we're now starting to look at some of the bigger issues. Uh, we're looking at um, helping the AI experts. We're looking at STEM education from K 20 and we're looking at international I just want to give a word about diversity. It's a part of the, an important national debate at the moment. Um, it, it is an essential, fair, and legal requirement that this society um, uh, champion uh, diversity, but it's also admission imperative. And, and the kind of diversity that we're having discussion about is very important, legally defined categories. They need to feel like they have full and fair opportunity, but we also need intellectual diversity. What we've described in the Solarian report is neurodiversity. We come at a problem differently. And we need to have skill diversity, meaning that we need to find a way for a collaborative endeavor to be built, not simply by people that are within a particular job profession or particular career track, but horizontally across our, our society. That's what it's going to take to prevail on any of these problems. All right. I would say, uh, obviously, our recommendations have been um, completed and our, our commission actually terminates in September. Um, but I think what the, the benefit of what the commission's recommendation does, I think, at a higher level is look at some of the, from our perspective, from the service perspective, look at how we can solve a number of our problems, including our cyber talent problem, from a more of a whole of government approach. Um, and we think that it will take, because we need uh, obviously cyber and um, tech talent across the government at all levels of government, right? So not, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level, we are seeing the challenges that, that state and local governments are finding. And so if we can look at this problem um, as a subset of a, whole, a more holistic approach to how we can solve this issue, whether it's through public-private partnerships, whether it is through um, a, government intervention at every level, um, and actually just going to young Americans and asking them to serve. Because what DDS found was no one's ever asked people, no one's ever gone to Stanford University and said, hey, have you ever thought about working for the government? And here's the reason why. And so maybe looking at this more holistically on where we can make pretty easy changes, but also start working on some of the larger issues that we face to be able to address some of these problems, I think is important because otherwise we will continue to have recommendations and we won't actually move the needle that much more. All right, thank you all for your time today. Um, I, a lot of work still needs to be done, but I'm encouraged. Um, I'm encouraged by what we heard today, especially from the hard work of your commissions. And Laura, thank you for um, for supporting this panel. And Cassandra, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, and all of the panelists. What a riveting discussion. Um, I think if I had to jump in, I would I would uh, query about our um, really our commitment for many of these uh, programs that we have worked with. Uh, from CIC for many years, what we often find is that great programs pop up 
among uh, the federal government, um, but we don't see a stay the course type of attitude to see whether or not the programs that are stood up, whether or not they're actually working, whether they're effective, whether or not they are producing the means, producing the ends that, that we're seeking. So um, I guess what I would say is that uh, is to encourage um, assessment and evaluation to be built into the process so that we can actually track to make sure that these programs are actually producing the type of uh, workforce that that we that we're looking for, and to stay the course. A lot of times, these programs come five years later; they're gone, and we, we're never never able to stay the course. So, I, I'm really um, interested in seeing the work of the commission in terms of even. Take that as a hint. <laughs> I'll take that as a hint to actually go ahead and um, and close off our program. So thank you again to all of our commissioners. Thank you to our panel moderators, to Dr. Juner and Dazdi Wingfield. Again, I want to say thank you to our panelists, including Dr. Griffiths, Congressman Langevin, uh, Ms. Skelly, Mr. Inglis, um, and Ms. Wada. Thank you all for your um, excellent remarks for the engaged discussion. I wanna also um, especially thank um, members of our audience who pose questions, especially CIC students for um, making sure to get into the conversation and to pose questions. So thank you students. Um, the learning never stopped and it was awesome having you as participants in this conversation. Um, finally, to the commission, um, again, I hope that members of the commission would see CIC as a partner to continue having this uh, critical discussion for the sake of our nation and our national security workforce. You can know that we are deeply committed um, to consider, to educate, to um, advocate for this type of necessary um, education for our, our national security workforce, and you can consider CIC a partner. Um, I just want to also give a, a, a shout out to uh, members of the commission staff, Diane Pinto and Laura Bates, who worked um, so well with us to, to get us uh, going for this for today's session. And then finally, to CIC's own director of strategic en engagement, Mr. Joseph Biz Billingsley, for being the point of contact. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that um, this discussion uh, perhaps gave you insight into what these wonderful commissions are doing to strengthen the national security workforce. Um, perhaps it even stems some additional questions that we can consider together about next steps in um, strengthening the workforce. This concludes today's session. Thank you again. It was a privilege to be with you all this morning. Um, be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you.